Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brian Kuhn, and I'd like to welcome you to the NEMA webinar, The Place of Death in Emergency Management, Community and Responders Impact. Thank you for joining us today. It is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Steve Sareff. Dr. Sareff is a nationally known healthcare lecturer, author, and experiential learning innovator. He has lectured throughout the United States on a wide variety of psychiatric topics, including suicide, elder aggression, psychiatric emergencies, documentation, the history of psychiatry, wellness and stress management. He is a diplomat in psychiatry, American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, and has years of practice in emergency psychiatry. He has been the psychiatric editor-in-chief for Medscape Reference, formerly eMedicine, part of WebMD. Dr. Sareff has written and edited 10 books and numerous healthcare articles, as well as being an authority on documentation and taught at several New England colleges and universities. Dr. Sareff, thank you for being with us today. The virtual floor is yours. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm calling you from right now snowy New Hampshire, where right now it's snowing, so Good morning to, good afternoon for those on the East Coast and those West, good afternoon. We have a, a re unusual topic, death, death in what you do. In many ways, I consider that kind of the elephant in the room, meaning it's kind of never talked about, but it's always there and always wondered about, and maybe that's why we're here to, to talk about it. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote a book called Ace Triplex, and when he said there's nothing that leaves such an indelible uh, uh, mark on the mind of man than death. And in fact, death defines all we do and all we life. In fact, it defines life. You're either alive or dead. And if you notice, when it tells you on your gravestones or whatever your mark is, when you're born and when you die, and it's an absolute demarcation. You see a bridge there. It's a bridge over some river. And I'm not sure what's on the other side. And no one is, but we know that death is there. And it's very much part of what we do and our work. And it's always there. Here's where we're going today. What is the reason for the death? Why are you all here today? And thank you all. Uh, for being here today for this. I want to make the case for the reason to include death in your curriculum. I want to talk, talk about some basic principles that will help you in when you're dealing with death situations. Uh, and I want to recognize the facts, what it does to you, and then show you what you can do about it and turn it over to you for your questions. So that's where we're going from here. The World Health Organization has recognized the death is an important component in what you do uh, in emergency care. The humanitarian community recognizes that proper management of the dead is a key component of disaster response. It's also a key component of every one of your responses for anyone who works in an emergency department, which I've done. Anyone who deals with the public in, in a disaster. I want to point out that the other key word in the slide that we just saw was the word dignity. It recognizes the dignity of the human being in all what we do. Now, we have a, in trauma, we have a curious relationship with death. Many of you remember before the, uh, all this work with the trauma centers, in the old days, the local ambulance company was also the local funeral home. And I've had experiences where, as a psychiatrist, I was having a patient brought to the state hospital by ambulance, but the person who was driving the ambulance had just driven a hearse and came as if he was at a funeral, which he didn't go to. So many of you remember the old Cadillacs were, in fact, hearses, and those things were together. We've come a long way, baby. In a way, all of our work in disaster and emergency is we are on a race against or death. Yeah, that's a weird but cu curious slide. I know, and I when I do emergency work in the emergency department, one of the 
things we're racing against is to make sure the patient doesn't commit suicide or homicide. So it's always there. Or we're, you're rescuing people so that they don't die. So every part of your life is, in fact, a somewhat of a race with death. Let me make the case for death. There was a very famous, does anyone remember Katrina in August 29th through 31st, 2005? This picture became the poster boy for the disaster. I think it was the Superdome. All the people were brought there to rescue them. Evelyn Freeman was brought there by her son from a nursing facility. And she was there and she died and he was by her side all the time for four days. She was dead in this wheelchair and he just sat by as a vigil. He was finally ordered to leave, which he then did reluctantly, and he went home to Alabama. And that picture was a haunting reminder that within uh, Katrina, there was death. You can see, I'm not sure a happy ending, but a complete ending where they finally did reunite uh, this gentleman and his mother, and he could bury her properly. This kind of pointed out in the midst of that how much disaster and emergency work involves death. It also involves the work of all of us in emergency management. Hopefully you all know the fireman's prayer. I got to say it's not politically correct. It's the firefighter's prayer, uh, prayer should be called, and this is somewhat uh, a sexist prayer and I, hopefully it's updated but the key word is in this prayer and if according to my faith i am to lose my life please bless with your protecting hand my family and my wife or my partner so it's a recognition that you all in emergency management are in fact are susceptible to death too 9-11 is one of the great moments in our lives, all of our lives, collectively. And look at how death played a role of it. 2,753 people died, of which 343 were firefighters and paramedics. Just an incredible amount of people on the front line that in fact death is part of your job. The firefighters uh, prayer was unfortunately answered in those cases. Mayor Giuliani, the mayor of uh, New York at that time, attended 200 different funerals for EMT uh, for police and firefighters. It's a huge part of our work, and that just underscores it. Scores it. One of the uh, unknown stories about 9-11 is we'll get to this later on in more detail, but in the Jewish tradition, when one dies, the body must not be left alone. So that, for example, uh, I happen to be Jewish, and if I died, I would be in a funeral home or before I was buried, but my body would not be alone. There would be someone standing there or sitting there reading prayers for all the time my body was not interred. So this was done all the time they were actually removing the rubble from the Twin Towers. And, now, and this is an Orthodox tradition, but many other Jews carry this forward, that a woman would be for women in there, a man for man, but they would actually be citing Psalms of David 24 hours a day until the last of the debris was removed from the World Trade Center. This is just one more component of, of uh, aspect of death. One of the other things that will keep it on New Hampshire is that we have 48 mountains in New Hampshire that are 4,000 feet or higher. Right after 9-11 happened, a group of people said, we want to do something. And they hoisted a flag on one of these peaks. Ever since then, it is a wonderful tradition in New Hampshire that on the Sunday closest to 9-11, for all 48 peaks, Every peak flies an American flag from noon until 2 p.m. in a memory and a vigilance for those who have died and the heroism of those who helped to try to save them. This is how, again, death is very much part of what we do. And to remind us of how, in fact, death does come 
home to us on June 28, 2013, in Yarnell, Arizona, 19 of the elite firefighters would die, died as the winds shifted. So just remind us that it is part and parcel of what we do and what we say every day. Now, this is not what we're going to talk about. There are books, and it's just to show you an example uh, of a book that is how to handle mass casualties. Frankly, I'm a psychiatrist, and I'm not going to go there. But I wanted you to know that those things are available. But I wanted to point out to you, there's a um, Management of Dead Bodies After Disasters, a manual for first responders by the Pan American uh, uh, movement, uh, health movement. And I want to point out what this manual says. This manual has two broad aims. First is to promote and the proper and dignified management of the dead bodies. That's the first term we saw from the United Nations, the dignification, the dignity of the dead body, the, the body itself. And then second, to maximize the identification of that body. There's a, a, in the military, in many countries, and certainly in America, the idea is you don't leave the body on the battlefield. You bring it home for proper burial. Identification becomes a cornerstone of everything we do. Now, I'm going to switch gears. And if I were lecturing on, in front of you, I would wiggle in front of I would jump in front of the stage and st my students would say, why is he jumping across the room? And I'm going to say, I'm jumping to say, this is a transition. I am now going to trans transition into Instead of the case for death, I'm going to show you what you can do about death. And one of the things you can do about death is be aware that every religion, every ethnic group has their own rules, rites, and rituals connected with the dead body. And I'm just going to go through a, a kind of some of these so that you're acquainted with them. In the Muslim tradition, it is one of the things that you can't, uh, should be buried as soon as possible. And in fact, in some Muslim countries, it's done that day or the next day. Uh, it is, and this is an important detail because you'll see how it varies. In the Muslim tradition, uh, it is not permissible to do cremation. The Catholics have a, a lot of very important rituals connected with death. Uh, many of you and others have attend, attend wakes, and to be reminiscent, we all, on some level, attended the wakes and funerals for John F. Kennedy. But the Catholics have certain rules in that they uh, can't do it on certain holidays and that uh, embalming is permitted and they're not opposed to cremation. But I just want to point out that this is their tradition is uh, something before uh, the funeral, which is called a wake. The Hindu tradition tradition goes the opposite way, in the sense that you, A, are not allowed to touch the body at all, and B, the funeral is held soon, but it is there, it is expected. The tradition is cremation, except for children, babies, and saints. In the Jewish tradition, again, it is a, a quick burial. They do not do embalming. They do not, uh, and it's if you were to die today, you would be buried tomorrow unless the family had trouble getting there. Again, someone is with the body until it is interred, and they're saying prayers. One of the interesting things is that in the Jewish tradition, for many people who died, there is included sand from the Jerusalem, uh, from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem in the casket. Okay. So that's the Jewish tradition. Now, in contrast to the Catholic, in Judaism, you bury the person basically right after they die, and then there's something called shiva, where you're saying prayers over the body for uh, the next week. And then you come to the person's, the bereaved family, uh, family uh, and uh, grieve with them. One of the interesting rules in Judaism is that when you, uh, uh, in bereavement and you go after you bury the person, there is a rule that says you must eat. It's not a matter of, you know, I don't feel like eating, uh, let it go. It, it's a uh, rule in Judaism that the grieving must eat. So it's a dictum. So that's the Jewish tradition.
I'm going to now switch gears again. I'm going to do my little dance. And I'm going a different route. The reality is you are going to deal with death. Death, as I say, when we started with the race, with the ambulance and the horse, it's life is not about how fast you run or how high you jump, but how you bounce well. Resilience, recognizing you will be dealing with death throughout your careers. So let's see what it does. Wow. In other words, do you remember uh, there's one of the lies we teach us, uh, that we teach in all the helping professions and maybe in all careers, the famous lie, leave your work and the work and uh, leave your home at home. I can guarantee you most of us cannot do that. I'm a psychiatrist and yes, I think about some of my patients after the session, after I've seen them in the emergency department, and I try to figure it out or try to help them even as I'm thinking. So I am incapable of leaving work at work. And I am also incapable of leaving home sometimes at home. I suspect many of you have had a, a fight with your significant other or your children or something like that, and it's come with you to work. So let's be realistic. There is the fact that death affects you. You are impacted by it. So let's look at all the ways it does affect you. Number one is a flashback. One of these amazing terms, a flashback is an amazing term because it, in psychiatry, this is called an ab reaction. Ab reaction means you actually re-experience the event, the experience, the event you're trying to remember, but you do it in real time. It's like you're in a trance. You are suddenly reliving the uh, that moment, and you're feeling all the emotions you did at that same exact feeling. Let me talk to you. What somebody? I can I think many of you can remember. Like for me, I can remember in vivid detail where and when I was when. Kennedy was assassinated. All of us can remember exactly when and where and what we did and what we thought when 9-11 happened, or the Challenger, or, or all these other disasters. The reality is that that is a flashback. And I tell you, it's, it's, it's an incredible event. You, you, you are transposed. Uh, like I had a, 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 one of my students, he was from uh, Vietnam, and a car backfired, and suddenly he threw himself on the ground, and he came up with a gun. He didn't have a gun, but suddenly he was back to Vietnam. That's what a flashback is. And you've had flashbacks of the people you've seen and the things you've seen in death. So, yes, it is a very powerful thing. Uh, does anyone remember in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, a number of years ago, six firefighters try to rescue some homeless people from a warehouse and died. I interviewed some firefighters then, and the lieutenant said, it's not only the major disasters, but all the eyes that are looking back at you of the dead you see. And those are flashbacks. So that is one of the really ways it impacts, disrupts, or is part of your life. So door number one, flashbacks. Sleep disturbances. Yeah, I'm going to sound like a psychiatrist. It either means when you sleep disturbances usually mean you have trouble falling asleep because you're thinking about it. You keep on wondering about it. It's called insomnia, or you go to sleep and you wake up and you can't get back to sleep. Or some people have uh, too much sleep where because to avoid thinking about it or even remembering anything, they sleep all the time. So it does affect your sleep pattern. Nightmares. It comes with a territory. Let me say, I'm going to, I'm going to thank, I'm, this is a shout out to all of you who do emergency work and a work in emergency departments. You guys have it easier than us, than you all out there that work as first responders, because you see life as it really is. And it's always in a snowstorm, 
a rainstorm, a cold night where the accidents occur or the tragedies occur, and you're out in the muck. I just get to see them in the emergency department, which is clean and lit, and there's other staff. My point being, you see the events that none of us want to talk about. They become the substance of your nightmares. There are, it's actually a nightmare disturbances where people actually can't go, they're afraid to go to sleep because of nightmares. That gets in your way, yes. Appetite, yeah. Uh, if you've seen some of these things you've seen, it really does, you don't want to eat. It doesn't, food doesn't matter, who cares? It usually means for many people, you don't want to eat and you lose weight. Or for some people, you actually, if I'm a little anxious, you gain weight, you eat too much. Disruption, yes, death disrupts your life. Does it lose your faith? Some of the work you do may in fact make you become cynical about human beings. And you see sometimes people at their worst. You also see people at their best and under disasters where people come to the best. But you wonder, when you see something like the Holocaust or 9-11, why can God, how can God do that? What, what, why have any faith in this? That is a, a, a potential danger of being confronted with death, which you do. The hallmark of, uh, you've, we've all been through the era called burnout. Burnout is a very interesting syndrome, which occurs with people that simply uh, don't get lose interest or lose connection to their jobs. It can happen in any field, but especially when you're confronted with death. Now, I'm going to give you a clue to how to hand, how to detect burnout in yourselves or some of your colleagues. Okay, how to do that? Very simply, is when you start to find yourself, or you see a colleague who is isolating themselves. That's a big word, big psychiatric word. Well, all I mean is they're withdrawing. Suddenly you don't want to eat with the gang. You suddenly want to go home early or you don't want to hang around anymore or you uh, by yourself, you separate yourself from your family. Isolation makes you want to, makes you think away from these things. And this has happened if in fact you've struggled or seen death. Next, yes, guilt. Wow. Now, I got to say, I'm a doctor, and I am been trained that the enemy is death. So I'm always feeling guilty if a patient dies. Now, that's in a one and one But there's a certain, I feel bad that I, I wish I had told Kennedy not to go to uh, Dallas, Texas. He didn't listen to me. I couldn't have told him anyways. But the point is, I think there's a certain guilt that your, our job is to prevent death. And if we lose them, we feel bad about it and we can feel guilty. Yeah. And guilt is, is a real feeling. Anger. Yes. Angry at God, angry at what you're doing, angry at life, angry at the perpetrator. There's all studies to show that whom are you more angry at? a quote, natural disaster, like a hurricane or tornado, or someone like the guy in uh, Las Vegas who shot everyone. Man-made tragedies, 9-11, there's much more anger, anger at the person that perpetrated this, anger at life, and for some people, anger at God. If you notice, by the way, some of this is paralleling what Kubler-Ross has called the five stages of dying which is denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So the next lab is depressed. How can you not be depressed by what you see? In Chicago, a number of years ago, a plane took off from O'Hare Airport, flipped over immediately after leaving the ground, and crashed smack into the ground. Literally hundreds of first responders all they could do was pick up body parts. We are trained to save lives, not pick up body parts. And so that's what they saw and that's what, it's depressing. Can you be anxious? Yes, I'm 
on some level, there's a death anxiety, because on some level, many of us are a little bit anxious about our own death or death. Death causes anxiety. Do we cry? Do we cry? Yes. Again, you're supposed to leave work at work and, and uh, home at home, but there's certain situations that make you cry, certain death situations, certain events where death occurs, you cry, and that's your response, and that's, that's good. It's good to cry, frankly. Finally, a distancing self from our work. In a way, it's isolation, but saying, you see it often with staff who deal with it all the time. They become immune or alien or distancing well, and they, they're not connected to what they're doing anymore, and they become robots, and I hate that because to me, the essence of all will work is for caring for people, connecting with people, and working with people. And when you become just um, moving people through and distancing from your job, it's no fun anymore. And what we're doing is important work, and you shouldn't distance it from you. So all I'm saying is these are all signs, by the way, of what can death does to us as responders. Now, it may be something very familiar to you. Some of you hopefully are running through your mind saying, oh my God, that sounds familiar. Isn't that PTSD? The answer is yes. <laughs> what you do on some level leads to some form of not necessarily full-blown PTSD. But it's said that all servicemen who return from Iraq and Afghanistan suffer from what's known as stress uh, uh, syndrome. You are going to be stressed by your work. You do have some form of PTSD. I remember one of my uh, colleagues who had responded to an a ambulance run where the victim, the person, was a friend of his. It was a traumatic experience. He had trouble returning to work uh, as a paramedic. So these are things that happen. All right, what to do about it? Now, I think one of my goals, I've been trained to think that us in the medical profession and all of us in the health and care, our enjoy, our role in life is to be advocates for hope. So I have right now talked about all the really difficult parts and impacts about death. But I, I, know, I don't want to leave it that way. I want to go in an entirely different direction. I want to go in a direction of you can do something about it. Whoa! What do I mean? I mean that let us be perfectly clear. You, you will experience death. You will see it, you will be, your troops will involve it, and you will know it, okay? But you can actually make yourself prepared for it. You can do something now. The great word is resilience. The great word is right now what you can do now to prepare yourself to, about when you are dealing with death. Now, I'm a psychiatrist. And as I kidded the staff who are very nice enough to help produce this show, that uh, I am going to waive all your co-pays for today as a psychiatrist. I will, in fact, ask for prior authorization. What do I mean is, what, what is my only tool as a psychiatrist? Yes, I use medication, but my big tool and only real tool is talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. When you see it, talk about it. When you go back, and I'm going to now give you ways in which you can become what I call stress resistant. I have a friend, uh, Ray Flannery, who came up with this idea of how to become stress resistant. All that means is that how to prepare yourself now for the stresses you are going to face tomorrow or tonight or this afternoon. These are six rules. They're not bad. One is to take a take charge attitude. That's redundant. What it means, I'm hoping that when you are confronted with these situations, 
you don't say, hmm, I feel a little bit upset about this. You have an idea, can do, take charge. I work and train paramedics, I train EMTs, and no one wants you to arrive at the scene of a, a disaster and say, hmm, I don't know. They expect you to take charge, and your mental attitude is, I am in charge, I am 911, I am in charge, and I'm going to take charge of this situation. Good. Number two, committed to a goal. This is the hardest one for all of us. Now, the goal may change for those in college. It's to get through college and medical school to get through medical school. For you, some people, it may be simple as, but what I want to be talk about is committed to a big goal. I have a big goal someday to write the great American book. Hasn't happened yet, but I keep working at it. I have a great goal of... Uh, eventually taking all my family to Disney World. I'm not sure what will happen, but it's a goal. Now, why does being dedicated to something beyond yourself help? Very simply, by having a major goal, then impediments like little annoyances or things that you deal with on the job can put in perspective. When I had a friend that we used to say, uh, we would jog together, and I asked him, How, what's the success to his uh, marriage? And he said, he and his wife, when he and his wife got into a discussion or an argument, he would think of himself, one question, is this worth my marriage? And he said, of course not, and then they would solve it. Now, if he's like many men, he would, of course, know that the wife is boss, and he would solve it that way. That's a joke, by the way, which we'll get to the last part we're getting to. But my point being... If you have some major goals and things that you want to accomplish, then life fits into perspective a lot better. The next is going to sound like a wellness campaign. And you've all been aware of this, but the reality is your body is your temple, but you can do things with your body in yourself that you can make you actually handle stress better. By the way, all of this is why I treat, teach a course. It's a Freudian slip, by the way, I, when I say treat or slip, or treat or teach. Uh, what do you call a sailboat owned by a psychiatrist? Right, a Freudian sloop. Somewhere someone laughed out there, hopefully. Anyways, so these are things you can do right now. One is your diet. Yeah, I've been aware. I've gotten rid of red meat uh, desserts. And cookies. I was addicted to cookies. The more you can be towards lettuces, uh, fruits, vegetables, the better your diet is and you'll lose weight. I'm a big fan of what do you call a cow that didn't have a calf? Decaffeinated. I'm in favor of getting rid of caffeine. Oh, my God, yes. I, I, I'm decaffeinated with my coffee. I would like to eliminate as much sugar as possible. Definitely want to get rid of smoking. And alcohol is not in my vernacular or drink in moderation. And one of the things that we all forget about is how much salt content. A paying attention to those things actually allows you to be much more in control of your uh, lifestyle. Relax. I don't know what you do for relaxation, but if you find some way to relax, it is a trip. It's be a yoga, meditation. Those things actually help in handling stress. And for me, Exercise is my best way of handling stress. I believe I will exercise an hour a day. I love frankly jogging. I'm slow at it, but I love getting out there and that really helps. The fourth thing you can do is simply seek others. It actually serves to fight isolation. But one of the problems many of us have is that our careers are isolated. You don't have the chance when you see someone or see death, whom can you talk about it? If you're lucky enough to have a partner that allows that, or many of you, just a few sections of a moment of debriefing, just around the station house, around with each other before you go home, talk about it, what you've seen, what you do, and it's very, very much uh, helps to get rid of it. Five, which I try to accomplish, is humor, warmth. Tell jokes. I think the greatest way is uh, to tell jokes uh, or laugh at jokes and find jokes. 
And one of the greatest rule, ways of learning jokes is the internet where you can share humor. Finally, and this is why you're all here today, is you have a concern for others. You want for other people to survive and well, and that's why you're there. Now, it's your turn. I've given you some ideas about the fact that death is an important part of your work. What are some of your questions? All right, Dr. Sharuf, thank you very much for that. So I've got a list of the questions in front of me, uh, and I'm going to run through them. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, very enlightening, very interesting. Uh, I will make a note that I think it's aspirational for many of many of us. I saw, you know, when you wrote on the screen before you started talking about a caffeine, sugar, alcohol, salt, I started writing it down because I thought perhaps it was a recipe, uh, but then you recommended not doing those things, so I had to scratch that out. But again, really... Okay. Well, thank you, Brian. But uh, it does show you have a sense of humor. Did you laugh at any of those jokes? <laughs> I did. That's right. I did. I had it on mute, so don't well, we're, we're, we're successful then. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to go through some of the questions on the screen. Everybody on the webinar, you still have time. Uh, type in your questions, and we'll get to them. Um, I'll start with this first one here. Uh, how do you recommend emergency responders allow citizens to perform religious rites for their dead when the site is not safe? Uh, and that was a question I had as well. There will be circumstances where uh, we will be unable to allow uh, folks to meet that timeline that their religion dictates uh, simply because this, it's an ongoing emergency or disaster there. What happens in those situations and what can we do to help uh, facilitate whatever needs to happen there? I think the easy answer is that you give them an alternative. This is a dilemma you face because sometimes it is unsafe, but you still do not want to deny them the important uh, opportunity to practice it. So give them, a, a, if it's a disaster, maybe a site where they can at least pray at least off to the side, not in harm's way. Or for example, uh, in the emergency department, when you do get the body at least almost presentable that you could do let them observe it. Uh, in other words, it's not, it shouldn't be either or, it should be a compromise saying, your rights are, must be observed, but we have these other things which have to be followed and parallel, do a parallel track. Very good. Okay, uh, next question is good afternoon. I have prior experience in law enforcement and military. Oftentimes we use dark humor to cope with the inhumane things we see and deal with. Is this a healthy practice or does it simply suppress what we should be talking about? Uh, and I'm gonna add a corollary on that too, I think, or just a little bit more. What's the appropriate balance in our line of work between empathy uh, and distance and how, you know to make sure that we don't uh, stray too far to one side, which would prevent perhaps prevent us from doing our job or to the other side, which would make us not good at our job? How do we maintain that balance? Okay, it's a two-part question and it's a great question. Number one, I love uh, black humor, dick humor, whatever humor it is, the dark humor. The, the, I think it, it's a, a very useful way of doing it, but it should not be used as a substitute for uh, ultimately talking about how you really feel. Uh, the, the problem with humor now, and it's more and more dangerous, some of the great jokes that I used to use I can, are not politically correct, and for good reason. So as long as you use dark humor uh, in, in a confined setting with all the people that uh, accept those parameters, so it doesn't hurt any group or uh, uh, sex that you're around, then that's okay, but it, it, it is only one step and the other step must be there. Uh, the answer is yes, what I recommend is a, again a two-track process. Number one is at the moment you must dispatch yourself, you must do your job, take care of the, the body, the person, and help them or care for it. But then later on you must recognize what it's done for you and so you're not robbed of your empathy. And you can still be empathetic while being doing your job, can recognize that it 
the people around you are tremendously impacted by what they're seeing and what you're doing. Thanks, okay. and I appreciate the advice to uh, make sure that the audience that you tell that to is receptive of that. And I would add, never ever do it via email or other electronic device and make sure nobody's recording it either because no one else uh, who sees that outside of that conversation will appreciate it. Uh, and, and so, yeah, be very cautious when, when using dark humor to help with those situations. Brian, you are so smart because that is so, I can't tell you, open mouth and sit foot or two feet. We all do it. And again, yes, never put anything in an email. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Doctor, one of the a question here, what is your take on critical incident stress debriefing teams and their effectiveness? Okay, that's great. Uh, one, my favorite question. I think there's a lot of studies to show now that it is not as effective as they thought. It sounds like the right idea. The plane crash, my God, look what it did. And then they had it, and many people felt embarrassed, hurt, and uh, it, was, it was too much pressure. So. I am in favor of a whole different approach, which I would try to do with my local uh, firefighter rescue unit. And that is a series of discussions over time called, call it tri difficult patients, difficult situations, difficult uh, events, where you re meet on a monthly, every few months basis to just discuss what you've seen, what you've done, and therefore, you don't need to wait for a, a plane crash. You can talk about it. I remember one of the EMTs. She was well-trained. She went on her first run, and uh, the first, on her first run, the patient coded in the ambulance and died. She stopped being an EMT. So there, uh, I'm say, suggesting the opposite of a critical incident debriefing. I'm saying build it into your schedules of critical incident sessions where you talk and share with your colleagues what, what you're feeling and what your thoughts are in, about these events and uh, so it doesn't build up. Good, thank you. All right, next question. What mental health organizations can we refer our first responders and survivors to? Do you have some ideas for that? I believe that any good psychiatrist, psychologist, or social worker should be able to lend you an ear. They should be able to listen. Uh, there are some, uh, I think there's a hospital in Brattleboro, Vermont, that specializes to folks who are responders and their traumas. But I, I think any uh, good mental health provider it has the ability, and the key ability is simply to listen, and to listen, to listen. You've got to talk about it and reflect on it and then to a, 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 another person. And that's who I would think, to, okay, this is uh, a joke coming up, Brian, but I'll also read. How, much, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? The answer one, provided the light bulb wants to change. So laugh, Brian. Uh, you the got answer it. Is, uh, the answer is that that making the step that I need to talk about it, any mental health professional can help you. There's some that specialize in it, but you don't need a specialist. You need someone that will listen. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next one is not a question, but I'm gonna turn it into a question. It was a comment from one of our viewers here today uh, who states that she's been smoke-free for two months, alcohol-free for almost 10 years, not doing so well on the caffeine and sugar. Uh, but congratulations on the smoke free for two months. I, I'll tell you that one of the things that I would see at activations in the emergency operations center is folks who uh, were unable to maintain that smoke free status. And after being smoke free for months or years, they would revert back to it. What can we do as leaders perhaps to help our folks, our employees, uh, stick to their plan, you know, so what can we do for employee wellness in those kind of situations to help them manage their stress? Great question. Uh, great observation. Here's the quick, you have to view diet, uh, giving up smoking, uh, uh, lessening alcohol as a process. There are some ups and downs. It's not either or. So you have a setback, a remission, or a uh, lapse. 
but that should be treated only as a lapse and recognized. Here's a really sad and scary statistic. It takes the average person 18 years to stop smoking because it's so difficult. It's more difficult to stop smoking than they claim using heroin. The point being is that view the, all these changes in your lifestyle as a process where it's not where you it's not a defeat it's just a setback and you can keep going and you, uh, if you ever go to AA meetings uh, they it's if you get cheerleaders so people say yes I fell down but then I got up get some support and keep going all right very good uh, the next one is another question from me uh, over the last few years you we have seen in our profession uh, perhaps some more aggressive language as we reach out to citizens to, how to, to try to help them prepare for a, an impending storm. Uh, you've seen the weather, National Weather Service use the words uh, death or die in some of the warnings they would put out. You've heard emergency managers talk about if you don't evacuate, go ahead and take a marker and write your social security number on your arm or issue body bags or toe tags, things like that. Are we, is that strategy uh, effective, do you think? Do you think the threat of death in those situations actually motivates people to action or are we being, uh, is that a bad strategy? You no, know, that's a great question. They have found in the DARE program that those things don't work, uh, that scaring people uh, doesn't work. Uh, the w w examples of neighbors that do the right thing uh, is more uh, effective. Uh, we saw, you know, I just reviewed the, when Mount St. Helens, Mount St. Helens erupted, and they told all those people they could die, and they didn't evacuate. So uh, I, I don't know of scaring people, but showing examples of that there are alternatives and uh, that uh, the neighbors are doing is going to be far more effective. Okay. Uh, the next one is uh, a recommendation for NEMA, and I want to get your thought on this. Uh, NEMA, the National Emergency Management Association, oftentimes helps to set national policy and not just federal policy, but national policy in that we can influence the things happening within our states and perhaps achieve some uniformity across the states. Uh, this one is from one of our, our viewers who is a uh, search and rescue uh, specialist who says, some, you know, occasionally they do not, when they go out and do a search and rescue, they don't find the body and then they have to go back and notify the next of kin that they haven't found the body and now that they, they ask how do they get a death certificate uh, it appears that that process differs from state to state uh, is there are there policies aside from this that you were aware of that could benefit from some more uniformity across the states in a, in to allow us to deal with these situations uh, more efficiently effectively uh, and empathetically well, I'm going to do a, a politician answer. I'm going to sidestep that because I don't know. Because uh, my hope, <laughs> the reasons I remember I had made uh, to fill out a birth certificate when I delivered babies, and it was sometimes hard to get people to do that. But let me switch gears entirely uh, to answer it a different way. What well, I've had to work with search and rescue, and those guys are fantastic. But what? I've learned in my medical training is that when you are confronting the families, you need to do two things, say two things, and two things, one, that the person died with little or no pain. I mean, you not know, know that, but to reassure them that they, were, they, they died without pain. The second you want to do is say to them, that you've done everything possible, that you didn't withhold treatment because they were this or that. You did everything you could. Now, come back to when you are confronting families and telling, we looked and we could not find the body, you at least got to tell them all the details of everything you've done so that they know that if they had gone up there, they couldn't have done it any more thoroughly. Uh, there is now rules that have allowed, I think, first responders to pronounce people dead. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. Well, so that you, you're on the right track. If you can have national rules for that, 
then it's, I think it is worthwhile to come up with some national rules on how that. Now, that, that is a kind of a certificate thing. It doesn't necessarily cover the legal thing of how long one has to wait to prove someone's dead, and that's a legal area, and that's not my view area. Okay. Uh, and while you were giving that last answer, another question came on, I think, it, along the lines of that. But basically, they want to know, uh, they that this person was taught to not use euphemisms like no longer with us, passed away, and that you say the words dead, death, and dying. Is that correct? And is that, uh, or, and is that the best way to communicate to family members? Okay. I'm going to go back to my training. I was trained when you're confronted, when you're dealing with the family, you try to get them. It's kind of a little bit, a little bit of a uh, situation where you try to get to them to say, is he dead or is he gone? Rather than you say he is dead or gone. Uh, it is true that the family will remember for all the rest of their lives exactly the, two, the words you use. But the reality is that if you can get the family to ask, oh, you mean, I, I think maybe he's gone, or did he die? Ask to see if they, how they would phrase it, and then you can say, yes, he has died. I know it's a little bit of a, a trick, but it is very effective if you can kind of get them to have that mindset of saying, oh, maybe it did happen, he did die. Hmm. Is there, are there trainings available to people that help in these kind of situations to have those conversations? Absolutely. I was trained as a doctor to have exactly those conversations to how to tell a family, uh, a loved one, yes, or a friend that someone has died. And absolutely, you can be trained in it and you can say, at least, there's never the right word, but the, the better words that, that at least uh, work with them. Yes. Okay. Uh, a different line here, a question from a viewer who says, have you reviewed Psy Start? And I'm going to spell that out. It's capital P-S-Y and then all lower, uh, then all uppercase S-T-A-R-T. So Psy Start from Dr. Chip Schreiber from California. And if so, what are your thoughts on it? I'm sorry, I haven't, but uh, it sounds interesting. Okay. All right. Well, that's one for everybody to take a look at. Again, it's Psy, P-S-Y, Start from Dr. Chip Schreiber. All right, if the, um, here's another one, I'm just reading this as I say it. Uh, hold on a minute, let me get down to it. Uh, if we say they had no pain and circumstances would dictate that there was, they learn later, don't we lose credibility and any effectiveness thereafter? It's a danger. Uh, if in fact there was pain, you can try to minimize it, but uh, again, there's euphemisms like discomfort, but they want to know about pain. Uh, I don't know that answer. Uh, you don't want to lose credibility, but you also want your goal, and that is, is to treat the family as the patient and to make them as comfortable as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got one more. Uh, Sam, I'm not positive that I'm going to ask this properly because I don't know the terminology here, but I'm going to ask it. What is being done to address the needs of the, quote, black tag slash quote, expectants during a mass casualty event who are conscient, who are conscious. So I assume that those are folks who are, uh, are about to die. I'm not positive uh, on that because that's not a phrase I've come across before. Doctor, do you know that those terms? I don't know that term, but it, it, there is a, a very difficult situation that uh, occurs in triage where the, you have to make decisions that some people, regardless of what can be done will not survive, and there's other people that you can help survive if you intervene right then. And I guess the reality is that you have to, what you say to someone to say, uh, other one, uh, I don't know, it's a great question, and it's a great predicament is to say, look, uh, I'm, I, I can only do what I can do, and there's other people that I can save. I, that's a great question. and. I wish I know, and I hope I'm never in that position to have to be in a, in a black tag in that. Well, thank you, doctor. Uh, we've come to the end of our hour here. I, I know some of you, I, there's a couple more on there I did not get to. For the rest of you, if you still want to add in some questions, by all means, please do, and we will uh, answer them via email. 
Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us for the NEBA webinar series today. And thank you again, Dr. Saref, for sharing your experience and expertise. Uh, a very interesting topic, one that does not get discussed enough, uh, but we all certainly deal with. And so I really, again, appreciate the opportunity to have you on today. Uh, and, you know, I think we've all benefited from it. Uh, thank you all. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Saref. Everybody, enjoy the rest of your day.